you to be a part of this today and listen. I would ask that if you have any questions, to please ask him. Um, Jacoby McFadden is going to talk today. He has a different perspective um, than you guys have heard in the past. Also here today is Mr. Joe Montone, who is in charge of this Wings Men program, if you will, that we're trying to bring people in um, to speak with you. He also will answer any questions that you guys may have. So. Good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for having us back again. Uh, today, uh, Jacoby McFadden will uh, uh, bring you uh, some good information. I want you to just listen up. He's been with the Wings program for four years. He's a personal friend of mine. Uh, Jacoby is uh, doing a great job as a speaker. Last week, we were together inside the uh, Philadelphia prison system. He was at our graduation and gave a great talk to about 20 guys who were graduating from the Wings program inside uh, the Quran Frommel uh, Correctional Facility. So we get 200 men every year come through the program. We have a lot of women also. And uh, Jacoby's been with us four years. For four years I've, I've, I've communicated with him. He's called me. He's done a good job of doing what he said he was going to do. He's a man of his word. And that's why he's here today. He's been to our recovery homes, been to the prisons, and he's here with the schools. He's been with me on radio, on our radio show. So, you know, he just actually came off of work today. So, Jacob, I want to thank you for coming in. Thanks, and, no uh, problem. No and uh, problem. just uh, being here to be a guest speaker for the, uh, the kids here at uh, Pensbury High School East. Okay? Thank you. Yes, exactly. 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 My name is Jacoby McFadden, 42 years old. I got two sons, 21, 16. And the reason why I'm here today is not to benefit me, but to benefit you all. Give you a little history about myself. Like Mr. Montone said, we met each other four years ago when I came home from prison. I came home from prison. I did five years, two months in prison for making some bad decisions and some poor choices that cost me 62, 62 months of my life behind bars. State prison and federal prison. I was in state prison and federal prison for drug sales and guns. Went to prison when I was 34, came home when I was 40 years old. Had a good life. Read by my father, even though my mom and dad got divorced when I was very, very young. One thing my dad always pushed was education. <coughs> Going to school. <coughs> my dad believed in the education, and education was so important. Came out of high school in 1990, went to college, a radio announcer. Doing good. But got hooked up with the wrong crowd of people. You always gotta watch that company. Peer pressure, your friends. Started, when I was in college, I started selling marijuana or something now. I sell a little bud, get extra dollars in my pocket. But once I went from marijuana, I started graduating. Cocaine and the crack cocaine, and then I was out of college, and I was full-fledged in the streets. Selling drugs, doing what I want to do. I thought it was cool having a pocket full of money. I thought it was cool having different females every day. I thought it was cool driving the flyest car. To me, I thought that was cool. It's cool for only temporarily for that moment. Didn't know that the lifestyle that I was living had consequences that come along with it. So you can do what you want to do, but it will be consequences that come along with your actions. On my way going back to South Carolina, July 17, 2006, got pulled over on the highway. Whole lot of drugs. And I had, gun, I, had a, I had a gun charge pending already for the feds. My life was on a downward spiral. Everything I did, it just arrest after arrest after arrest in 2006. Going to prison was something new for me. I got arrested a couple times, one or two times maybe. I was in, bail money, right out of jail. Didn't stop. Kept on doing what I was doing. But see, when you make a mistake in life, not only it hurts you, it hurts everybody around you. My kids missed 
six birthdays. I missed six Christmas. Mom and dad couldn't sleep at night because of what I done. Like I said, I'm here. I don't know. I don't know your situation. We all have a situation. We all have a mountain that we have to climb in life. If I could use my experiences, what I've been through, and the road I've been down, to make this one of y'all realize, hope that it is a better way. In this room right here, I know some doctors. I know some lawyers in this room. I know some dynamic students in this room. I can look at you. You might have made some mistakes in life, yes. You might have done some wrong in life, yes. We all have done that. But this school right here, this, this program that y'all are in, these administrators and teachers are here to help you. They're not here to harm you. I don't want y'all to go down the same road I've been down. Matter of fact, I was in nine different prisons, seven different states, two federal, with two federal halfway houses. Not because of disciplinary reasons, but when you have two different situations, they bounce you around. This prison, you be there for a little while, you go to the next prison, to the next prison. But when I went to prison, it actually saved my life. You know why it saved my life? Because I was in the streets, knee deep, knee deep in the streets. You thought about gang bang. So far I did the streets, let me gang bang too. I'm just so blinded. I thought it was being cool. When I went to prison, I got myself together. I got connected to a higher power. That changed my life. He changed my heart. He gave me a different outlook on life. Things I used to say, I didn't say anymore. The thing, my thought process has changed. See, I wasn't afraid of change. You know what stagnates a lot of people from growing? They don't want to change. They feel as though if I change, oh, uh, that's not cool. Like I said, I'm here, I'm, I'm here to, like I said, it's some dynamic students in this room right here. <clears throat> what do you want to be when you grow up here, man? No clue? How about you, young lady? Oh, social worker, dealing with people. That's great. You know, you can accomplish anything that you want to accomplish if you put your mind to it and go at it wholeheartedly. Same thing with you, young lady, a social worker. Dealing with people, helping people. That's one thing I love to do. I love to help people. I love to, I love to encourage people. I love to use the things that I have experience in life to help somebody else out. <clears throat> you don't have to go down that avenue I've been down. Yes, sir. Can you uh, just uh, tell everyone a little bit about the challenges you've had in finding work uh, as a result of uh, your background? Oh, yes. I'm a four-time convicted felon. Not once, not twice, not three times, four-time convicted felon. When I came home from prison, you know, when you're a convicted felon, it's hard to get a job. It, 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 it's, a stripe, it's a stripe against you. Once you put on the application, a lot of employees just tell you no. Oh, no. Before they even know what your charges are or your charge is, they already, they already disqualify you from employment. But one thing, I, one, thing I, one thing I've done when I was in prison, I rehabilitated myself in prison. I didn't wait till I came home for rehabilitation. I done it. I done it when I was in prison. So when I actually came home, I put applications at application at applications. I kept being persistent. I didn't want to go back to that same lifestyle that I lived, or trying to catch up the five years, two months I was incarcerated, trying to catch it up. I want to live a life for peace. When you doing when you doing illegal activity and stuff, you got look you got look over your back. You don't worry about the, 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 the cops. <laughs> you, you, I mean, you put yourself in so much high risk and so much danger. But I kept being persistent until I got a job. 
Somebody gave me a chance and an opportunity to make a difference. I was working at a place called um, Baker's Industry in Malvern, PA, when I was in the federal halfway house. And when I actually came out of the halfway house, I got hired at ShopRite. You see my, my uniform on at ShopRite. They took a chance on me. Nobody took a chance on me. They seen the sincerity and the honesty and the integrity in my heart. Give me an opportunity, a chance to make a difference. You all will have the opportunity and that chance to make a difference. It's what you do with the chance and opportunity, the chance and opportunity when it's presented to you. I'm not saying you're not going to fumble the ball, but you want to keep fumbling the ball on the same yard line. You want to move forward. You want to do the right thing. You want to make your mind. You want to you make your mom and dad proud. Of you you want to make your school proud. Of you want a young kid to look up to you and say, well, you know what? This right here, this guy right here, he's doing very, very well. See, it's not where you've been, it's, it's not where you've been, is where you're going. Mr. Montone always told me that I always keep that in my spirit. Yes, I've been in, yes, I've done some bad things in life. But I don't let that stagnate me and hold me down. I'm moving forward now. I'm in the process of having a reconnection back with my kids. The job is going pretty well. You know, you have your, your challenges on your job. I can think straight. I got my driving license back. So when you're doing illegal stuff, man, you don't care about no driving license. All you know is a life of crime, a life, a life of uh, illegal activities. At 18 years, I got my driving license back. Paid them, got them back. So I made a decision that I want to keep my mind focused on the right things and the right people. Wrong people can get you caught up. It's easy to get caught up. Trouble so easy to get in, but so, so, so hard to get out of. I know. I've been down that road. <coughs> yes, sir. Jacoby, when you said that you were dealing weed and you were dealing cocaine, then crack cocaine, and running drugs, how, how, and uh, running guns, how much drugs did you take yourself, and how much alcohol did you drink yourself? Well, never did drugs. Never was addicted to drugs. Never did alcohol. I was just a, a seller. Never. But see, what people don't realize is that a drug user, a drug dealer is no different than a drug user because you get addicted to the money. Uh, all, all night. All night. Making money all night. Can't sleep. I actually, when I got incarcerated in 2006, I think I slept a whole week in prison. Almost a whole week. I was so tired for 15 years of running the streets. 15 years of just wear and tear on my body from 19 to 34 years old. I had deep bags up under my eyes. Deep bags under my eyes. I was being destroyed. I was destroyed and killing myself at the same time. Didn't even know it. So being incarcerated, it does, it does some good for me. It saved my life. Because if I had not been incarcerated, I probably wouldn't be, I probably wouldn't be here today <coughs> standing talking to y'all. I'd have been in gun battles, shotguns to the head. I, I, I've been down that road. Robbed, all that kind of stuff. So all that stuff comes when you're living wrong. Not saying that you could be an honest person doing the right thing and get be at the wrong place at the wrong time. I'm not, I'm not saying that. But I always, I think the streets are always at the wrong place at the wrong time. Any questions? Yes. Did you go through any troubles in prison? I actually I did. I almost had one incident, but. I had to use my head. And see, sometimes when you when you when you react out of when you try to react out of anger, you get yourself caught up. I had one situation that almost occurred when I was in prison, I think it was 2009, but the issue was resolved. And matter of fact, me and this inmate, we became real good friends. Real good, real good friends. See, sometimes you gotta put you gotta put your pride on the side. Your pride will get you jammed up. You gotta be humble. You got to show humility. Yeah, humility is not a sign of weakness. Humility is a sign of a person that's doing positive things. 
that pride will get you caught up every time. If I would let my pride got in the way when I was in prison, I probably still would have been in prison right now today. Is there a lot of violence in prison? Yes, it is. What you see on television, like odds, ah, it goes like it goes down like that in prison. People getting stabbed, people getting uh, hit in the head with a lock with a sock. But those are the people who are still taking that same mentality from the streets inside of the prison. They still want to deal drugs, they still want to get high. What's the price you got to pay? It goes on like that. It goes on like that. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Like, how do different students in different school districts, mm -hmm. different areas, take your stories? Well, this, this, this is my third school I'm speaking at. I actually spoke on the west side about a couple months ago. It was the west, this is the, west, this is the east side, right? The west side. I spoke over there. I spoke at Valley Day. I was like, Oh, they, they, they really enjoyed the story. They really enjoyed the story. They were very, very attentive. They were very, very attentive. I'm not here on no, no scare straight movement. No, I'm not here to scare you. I just want you to make some positive decisions. I want you to do the right thing. It brings me joy when I can give back. Mr. Montones and Jacoby, can you please speak? Yes. I need you to speak at the prison, yes. Because it's all about giving back. I love to share my story. Because the story, the, the experiences that I've been through, young man, it's not for me to keep. It's not for me to hold on to. It's for me to tell somebody. If I can just reach one person from going down that bad road, if I can plant a seed in somebody's heart without going down that bad road, that brings joy to me. That brings joy to my spirit. It's real out here in these streets. I don't know. I don't know your situation. I don't know what you're into. But streets don't play fair. It never. It never has, and it never will. Yes, sir. Jacoby, as you're giving back now, when you were dealing drugs and guns, did you ever care about people? I, I cared about people. I always. A lot of people say, Jacoby, you are in the wrong business for the wrong thing, lifestyle that you live. Because I always had a caring heart for people. I always, <coughs> I was never the type of dude to talk down on a person. Even when I was in the street selling drugs, I never, customers, I never, I didn't, I didn't use words like crackhead or you this, you that. No, I was, no, I always had a kind heart for people. I always had a loving heart for humanity. More like a philanthropist type person. Yes, sir. Well, when you get caught with your first? I got caught. My, actually, my first drug charge. To give you a rundown on my felonies, my first drug charge, I was 22 years old. I got, I got caught with um, 75 or 80 dime plastics. I was selling out a hotel in New Jersey. They kicked the door down. I got incarcerated. But back then, you got a slap on the wrist back then. It was a distribution charge, but it was a slap on the wrist back in 95. I got four years probation. But I didn't stop. Stopped about a month. And I ran for another, I ran for another 14, another, another 13 years, I kept hustling. Oh, I ain't getting in trouble. I would do some of the foolishest, most stupidest things. I would get on Greyhound bus with a key of crack on my, on my shoulder. I would get on, I would get on um, Amtrak with five or six guns, ammunitions and everything. I do a lot of foolish things. I sit back and I think about the, the things I used to do. I should have got life in prison for all the things I've done. You know? And then after that I caught the I caught the, the gun charge. And I had the felony, and then I had the drug charge and the, the gun charge, and I had a, a, a slight forgery charge too. So all that went on in 06. I actually did time for the, 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 the guns and the drugs. And the forgery, I had probation for that. Yeah. That's a little bit that that's my what I've done. Yes, sir. What did you do with all the guns and stuff? Like I was selling. Did you ever use them? Or? I mean, if I had to, but I, 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 I sold them. I, I got them from down, so it was a quick flip for me. So I was the type of hustler, I was in the quick flips. I wasn't the type of hustler that, that take, that, 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 that get hold of something and, and sit on it. I want to get rid of it as quick as possible. If I bought something, if I bought, if I bought a gun for $100, if I get 130 140 for it, it's a quick flip for me. 
I was in a quick flip. Get it, boom, move it, and keep moving. That was my motto. Yes, sir. Jacoby, uh, before you made some of these decisions, mm -hmm. did you ever think about the consequences of what could happen? You, you always think of the consequences because you, you know subconsciously you're doing something wrong. See, man is driven by passion instead of reason. My passion, I got to get this money. The reasons are the ramifications that come along with it, the consequences. I knew one day that I was going to come crashing down. I, I knew it. I knew it. Actually, when I got stopped, on Interstate 95 in Merlin, when a state trooper, actually two state troopers came to my car. They pulled me over, they said, well, sir, you were, you were tailgating. You know I'm scared to death, I ain't got no driving license, I'm in a rental car, and I got 84 grams of between powder and crack cocaine on me. The first officer came with the dog, went around the car, dog didn't signal. I said, ooh, ooh, we, I'm gonna get away. I'm gonna escape again. But then the second officer came. The first officer never checked my bag, but the second officer did. The second officer came, when he checked my bag, when he, and I, when he checked the bag with the drugs, I, I knew it was the end of the road. I knew it was the end of the road for me. Because when he actually opened the bag, once he identified the drugs, the drugs wasn't bundled up. They were visible. Once he seen the drugs, he drew on me. Get down. And like I told Mr. Ma, I told Mr. Yeager, it was 100 and something degrees outside that day. It was 9 o'clock in the morning, July 17, 2006. It was about 105, 106 degrees outside, 9 o'clock in the morning. Actually, when he handcuffed me, they handcuffed me, they sat me down right by the squad car. Now, the engine is running. Now, mine was 105 degrees. But with that engine running, it felt like 250 degrees by that car. Went to the, went to the state troopers' bags. You know, they go through the protocol, strip search you, see if you got any more detainers or warrants or anything like that. Then they took me to the county jail. And I'll never forget, it was, it was this young state trooper. He said, man, you the last person I got to take to the county jail today. He said, I'm excited, I'm ready to go home. I said, why are you excited? Why are you going? Why are you excited? He said, man, the Baltimore Orioles play today. I'm going to the Orioles game with my girlfriend. I'm in the, I'm in the, I'm in the front seat. The handcuffs were kind of tight. I said, man, these, these cuffs are kind of tight. He said, Mr. McFadden, they're not designed to feel good. When he said that, almost nine years ago, that stuck into my spirit. It stuck into my mind. They're not designed to feel good. You know? That's a little bit about me, a little bit about my story. Right now, I work at ShopRite. Um, I'm assistant kitchen manager at ShopRite. I'm a full-time convicted fellow, but you know what? Hey, not where you've been is where you're going. You, you have a question, right? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. You ever uh, lose a client to your product? Mm hmm. Never somebody. use. Actually, Never nah, use. Nah, 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 nah. Mm -hmm. You ever see somebody die after using what you sold them? No. No. I never witnessed an uh, uh, old DNA like that. No. Never did. Yes. Well, nobody actually is. Um, the, the, my, my era in the 90s, you know. Crack cocaine was big. It, it was an epidemic that actually took over from heroin. Because heroin was a big drug in the 70s and the early 80s. But when crack hit the mid 80s, it just it just blossomed and it permeated all over. Um, it blossomed and permeated all over. Um, nobody introduced me to it. I started selling marijuana. But I, I, I noticed that you can take $20 and make $40. That was intriguing to me. I could take $20 and make $40? But the marijuana was too slow for me. I wanted quick money. And since the crack epidemic was, was at full blast in 90, 91, 92, I jumped on that bandwagon. Jumped on that bandwagon. All over the highway. I, 
New York City getting drugs, Florida getting drugs, it didn't matter to me. Atlanta, it, it, it didn't matter to me. I had to get it. I had to get it. Never tried no, I tried marijuana maybe once or twice when I was young. Never tried no crack, never snorted no powder, never did no pills, none of that. None of that. <laughs> Any other questions? Okay, so how do you feel about working today with the WINGS program and the Falls Township Police Department and giving back to the youth? It, it, it's, I enjoy it. I love it. You know, I just got off from work, so I said, um, you know, I love it. I love the things Mr. Yeager is doing, Mr. Montone is doing, programs like this, the Wings program, Fall Township Police Department. They're doing some very great things in the school systems. You're doing some, you got, you're doing some very, very good things, Mr. Montone, in the prison system. Giving back. In any way I can give back, I'm going to give back. Yes, sir. Were you nice to the judge when you went to court? Well, actually, when I got sentenced for the, when I got sentenced for the state, I had a five-year bond, bonded plea agreement. So I assigned to the five years. So he didn't ask me. I, I, I couldn't. I was already sentenced already when I, when I pleaded out to the five-year bond agreement. Now for the feds, I got 33 months for the feds, and I had one of the toughest judge in the federal system in Trenton, New Jersey. His name was Judge Brown. They call him Land Down Brown. One of the toughest. He was an older judge. And he was rough on gun charges. Guns and gangs, he, he was... But when I was in prison, like I said, I started my rehabilitation while I was, while I was in prison. I got a different programs. Not because I wanted the, the judge to show leniency toward me. It's because I wanted to do the right thing. Right things. I had about maybe 17, 18 certificates. Sent to the judge. A couple people wrote letters for me. When I got in front of this judge, he looked at me. He was an older judge. He said, Mr. McFadden, he said, I see you doing some positive things. Is you not just sitting complacent in the prison? He said, I see you got these certificates right here. He said, really, I'm going to give you the low end of the guideline, because in the feds, it's guidelines. So I'm going to give you the 33 months. I spoke, yes, Mr. Brown, so-and-so. He said, I never want to see you in my courtroom again. No new charges, no violations, anything. He gave me a second chance. He could have gave, gave me the high end of the guideline. I could have done six years. And plus, he ran, he ran my time concurrent with the state charge. He could have said, well, no, Mr. McFadden, you, do, you finish the state, then you do the federal time. He ran everything concurrent. Concurrent means um, together. I say we have two different charges for two different situations. So while you were in one prison, you didn't have to go to federal. Well, I had to go. I had to go finish down the state, then I had to come to the federal. But my time was actually sure. running in both places. It's like killing two birds with one stone. <coughs> That's what happened. You ever go any juvenile? No, no. When I was a kid growing up, I tell you, man, my dad was tough. I was reared by my father. He was tough. Um. He gave me everything I wanted, but my dad, for his school, he was real big on education. He's real big on education now. No, if I had a problem with a teacher in school, my dad said, let me handle that. That's what I'm here for. It's not your job to get no kind of altercation with a teacher. My dad didn't play that. But you know, that, that, was, that, that was my father. So I just want y'all to sit back and just marinate on what I what I spoke on today. I, I, I want to see y'all excel. I want to see y'all do good. The sky is the limit. Yes, sir. What is it like in jail when you're told when to get up, when to eat, when to shower, when to go to bed? What's that like? Oh man, at first it, it was kind of rough. It's kind of it was kind of rough because. Please dismiss it's, the boy's track at 135 you so today when you, when you and Jason Pettis at 140. Thank you. When you're free, you can go where you want to go, come back when you want to. But when you're restricted, 
It was a little tough. It was different. It was different. When they open your cell door, they say, okay, you got five minutes before child. Child is going to eat. You got five minutes. When they open that door, that door only stays. When that door opens up, when your cell opens up like that, you got a matter of seconds of getting out of there. If not, they close it, then you, you don't go, you don't, they're not gonna open it again for you. You didn't get no special you didn't get no special treatment. You didn't get no special treatment. Is there a favoritism? Hmm? Is there a favoritism? Well, I won't say I won't say it was favoritism, but if you were the type of if you if you're the type of inmate that didn't give them a hard time, do what you're supposed to do, it's like being in school. You in school, you doing what you're supposed to do. You're not acting up in school or you're not acting up in prison, you're not gonna have any problems. The problems occur when you get disobedient and not doing what you're supposed to do. Even in in, in, a, in a work field, school, prison whatsoever. You gotta be obedient to instructions. You have to be obedient to instructions. I know it's hard. It can be hard sometimes, but hey, that's that's what that's what it's all about. You gotta be, you gotta be obedient. How, how large was your cell? When I was in state prison, we had a very small cell. Me and another inmate, we, we had a four by twelve. Tight. Four by twelve is is, is um, four feet high, and twelve feet wide. Tight. I mean, you, you, you could, we both couldn't even stand up in the cell together. It was tight. And you had a bunk in there. You had you had a bunk. You had a toilet in there. It, it was real tight. And when I got to the federal system, it was a little bit different. The federal system, the rooms were a lot bigger. It was a lot bigger. But so when you make wrong decisions and poor choices, you gotta deal with things like that. Tight, it was real tight. How's the food, Jacoby? Well, the, well, the food down state prison wasn't as bad. Um, it wasn't as bad. Um, they gave you portions. I was working, I worked in the kitchen so I could get a little more, you know, so. Um, it's not the best, but you know you gotta eat. What's the longest you you've ever been locked down? As long as I've been locked down. Um, and could you explain what it means to be locked down? You solitary. Yeah, solitary. Yeah, locked down. Well, locked down and solitary is it's, 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 it's two different things. Now, when you're in solitary confinement, they call it ad seg, administrative segregation. You may be a person that's that's given um. The prison a lot of trouble. So what they do, they put you in administ administrative segregation. You lock down 23 hours a month. You get one hour for rent. You lock down 23 hours a day. I never experienced that. Now I did experience being locked down when you had violence on the prison and they locked the whole prison down for a week. Now I went through that the whole whole week. You got no movement. So no people in, no people out. No people in, no people out. They they come feed you on the tears and everything. No movement because of violence. Because of violence, so they resolve the violence, the, the violence and stuff like that. You're locked down. You're locked down. They take your phone, no phone privileges, no nothing. No commissary. Commissary is like going to the store. You fill a form out, you buy tater chips, sodas, and all that kind of stuff. Um, they take all that. And when you go to when you go to the hole, say if you fight, say if you and another inmate is fighting, you go to the hole. They call it the hole. They call it the shoe. They call it the box. Um, all, all your privileges are stripped. You got no privileges. You can't even write a letter. You can't even write a letter. Nothing. No phone calls, no nothing. You down 23 to 1. And you in a cell by yourself. Just imagine being in a lockdown for 23 hours a day. They gotta feed you through the slot. Mm -hmm. Um what's it like with other like inmates that I heard that like let's say someone from the outside gives you money or like you have permission to buy stuff. Uh, do they steal it from you? No, well, it all depends. Well, this, that's called that's called when people put money on your money on your books. Um, but you got people, you got guys in there that do stuff like that. They rob you in prison. I mean, you got guys who do stuff like that. You know, because a lot of them got that same street mentality. If you had that same street mentality on the streets, if you take them to prison, that's that's all you know. And that's when that's when all the, sh the, the, the shaking coming at. Or you got drugs in prison too. But you best believe you got plenty of drugs in prison. But it's double, triple, quadruple the price. Say so if you get somebody drugs, you can't pay them. So the guards sneak in? I don't know. Do they have ways of getting stuff in? 
Let's say if you give somebody drugs, you can't pay them. It's like on the streets. They're going to do something to you. Jacoby, you're a father. You have two sons. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us what it was like for you knowing that your sons were unable to have any time with you? Oh, it, it was rough. It, it, it was rough because when I actually got incarcerated, um, let's see, one of my sons was five, six, one was six and one was 11. They were, they were young when I went away. Just not to, to hold them and hug them and just to, I miss all the valuable times with them. You know, my, my, young, my youngest son graduated from junior high school. I was incarcerated at Christmas. It's nothing like, it's nothing like holding them. It's not like going to a restaurant. But see, I put that on myself. So what you do to get you put in a bad situation, it affects everybody around you. It affects everybody around you. Because a lot of times we don't think. We just react out of impulse. Consequences. Mm -hmm. First thing I done when I got out, ooh, I was in two halfway houses. So when I the first when I got the first halfway house, um, I had a, I had a pass to go to Dollar General. It's called, it was called a hygiene pass. Um, you get from the halfway house, you got an hour to go. Yeah, go to the dollar store, what sort of buy what you need to buy. It was just I couldn't believe it. Just really having money in my pocket because I didn't have no money in my pocket almost six years. Well, I'm five years, two, five, five years, two months. Just to go inside of the dollar store and grab what I wanted to grab, it was, it was amazing. Just to see people, I was like, wow. You, I mean, just, 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 I mean it, was, it, was just, it was just amazing. It was just amazing. Even when I first came home from prison, I was on my way going to the halfway house. I was like, wow. You know, just, I felt like I was 30 years behind. <laughs> I felt like I was 30 years behind. But I'm not trying to catch up on the time I've lost. I'm it's all about moving forward. Can you speak about the traffic tickets, the tickets you had to pay off, Jacoby, and where yeah, they I came had, from? Yes, when I, when I actually, like I said, my license was spent for 18 years. Getting tickets, drug charges, now paying fines and everything. Well, they actually had your driving license. And, um, at the time I was in, at the time I wanted to get my driving license back, I was living in South Carolina. I was in South Carolina for two years. I called Mr. Montone. I said, Mr. Montone, I need to get my driving license back. He said, What you call me? Call DMV. Call DMV in Trenton. I was working down south, I was working at Ruby Tuesdays. I was a chef down there. And I called the lady at DMV. She said, Well, this is your issues right here. These are your issues, which you have to resolve to get your driver's license back. You know, my dad said, okay, son, I'll help you. So when you're, the, when you're doing the right thing, when you're on the right track, people will help you. When you're not doing the right things and you're you, you, you being a nuisance, a person ain't going to want to help you. Nah, I ain't. But dad said, I'll help you, son. My dad gave me a piece of money. I saved a piece of money up. I paid one ticket off. I paid another ticket off. And that was on a payment plan. Got my driver's license. But just that simple. But I had a vision. Because I knew... I knew I needed my driver's license to get from point A to point B. Got him back. Almost two years. I keep him in my pocket. I won't do nothing to, I will do nothing illegal to jeopardize him, jeopardize my license being taken from me again. It's a privilege to drive. Yes, last, last Monday you were a speaker mm -hmm. inside the Philadelphia prison system. Mm -hmm. And you were able to speak and then come home after that. What was it like to know that you can come in and come out? Oh, man. I, <laughs> actually, that was my second time speaking at CFCF in Philly. The first time I went with Mr. Monton about a month and a half ago, just to walk in the prison, it gave me an eerie feel. Then, you know, everything's controlled movement in the prison. The doors, they buzz you in. And when the door slammed behind me, I looked behind me like, Mr. Montone said, well, Jacoby, you, you're going home. You, this, that. I was a little shell-shocked. But that was the first time going to a prison and coming straight home. The second time wasn't as bad. 
Second time, but the first time I felt like, and the seeing the guys in the in, in the inmate uniforms, I said, "Wow, that was once me." You know, that was once once me. You know, so it, it, it was a it was a beautiful experience just to go back and give that. Another question. Oh. Especially with my children. My children had to rebuild things with my kids. I had my oldest son, he's autistic. Um, he, he was excited to see me. He knew who I was after five years. Uh, my youngest son, he, he rebuilding things with him. I'm still in the process of rebuilding things with him. Um, well, he, I, he, was in, he was in elementary school when I left. He's in high school. He, he's in high school right now. He's in 10th grade. It, it, it was, uh, with my family wasn't, my, with my, my siblings, it wasn't too hard. Uh, mom and dad, it wasn't too hard. But, you know, the kids, it was a little bit rough with my, my younger son. You know, because he just, dad, why did you leave me? Why? You know? And that was the most hurting feeling. Why? Why was you at my graduation? Why? And I had to explain to him, where I was at. Because I'm not ashamed about where I've been at. You know? I'm not ashamed about where I've been at. And, you know, his mom always said, well, your dad on vacation. That's a term, that's a euphemistic term that people use a lot when a loved one is incarcerated. They're on vacation. But eventually I told him, yeah, I went in prison. I, you know, I did time in prison. Oh, so he didn't know you were in prison? No, he, he, he actually didn't. He knew I was somewhere, but he didn't know I was in prison. You know? Was it hard on him when you told him that you were? I mean, it, it was a little rough on him. You know, he asked questions there, why were you in prison? And I told him, guns and drugs. Guns and drugs. You know? So there's always a process of rebuilding that relationship back with people you have hurt. You know? You know? Yes, sir. How do you feel when you have a son and daughter? Mm -hmm. You have a son or a daughter? I, I got two sons. How do you feel if one of them was down the same road you did? Well, hopefully, I, I'm hoping pray they don't go down that road. Uh, my, my, like I said, my oldest son, he's autistic. Um, he has a disability. My younger son, he's real good in school. He's in them books. A-B student. He's in them books. He, I mean, fortunately, he don't have to go down that road. <coughs> I didn't have to go down that road. So a lot of times when we, when we get into trouble, a lot of times we like to blame things on our parents. Well, I came from a broken home. My mom was on drugs. My dad was on drugs. Uh, my uncle Johnny was a drug dealer. My dad never did drugs. My dad, my dad never lived a life of crime and, and criminal activity. My dad worked a job. My dad was a chef. My dad, he's a retired chef. My dad was a chef. My dad made an honest living. When my dad found out I, I was selling drugs I was 19 years old, it crushed me. But he knew he couldn't tell me what to do because I was grown. He said, son, I didn't, I didn't raise you like that. He said, I didn't raise you like that. Mm -hmm. Kobe, you said you went to high school and college. Mm -hmm. Why did you take the turn into the drugs? And what happened to the college studies? Well, just lights, cameras, action. I seen, you know, this, this, Feasting my eyes on the drug dealers in the neighborhood. Nice cars, pocket full of money. I had a little work study job making $200 every two weeks. You know what I'm saying? So I got caught. See, you get caught up on what you see. Oh, man. Start talking to one drug dealer. Well, you can do this and do that. Forgot about school. Once I got so knee deep into the game, I say game, into the into the, the drug dealing, you don't worry about doing nothing positive. When you're doing something negative, you're not worried about you're not worried about doing nothing positive. Positive is not in your vocabulary. All you're worrying about is making that next dollar, making that next dollar, making that next lick. That's how we call it in the street, that next lick. Never robbed nobody. That was never my stilo. That was never my thing. To put a gun to a person here, that, that wasn't my thing. I got robbed a few times in the street. Shotguns to the head and everything. Shot at and everything. It's only by the good Lord's grace and mercy I'm right here today. 
Is there anyone you actually trusted in the streets? Uh, uh, just a, a, a few people. There's a few people that, a few guys that I grew up with, and I know they had, they kept the codes, the code of the street, and they had a little bit of integrity in the street, but, um, you know, you really, don't, you really don't trust nobody when it comes to the streets like that, because the streets don't play fair. The streets never play, it never play fair, and never will play fair. And it's, it's worse than that. It's worse than that. It's worse than that. It's worse than that. Yeah. In this cell, so you described the cell, is the toilet also in the cell? Yes. So, how many, how many times do you change cellmates, and how awkward is it when you have to go to the bathroom? Are they do with you there? Oh, well, it's like, okay, we, it, um, you might change cellmates maybe it all depends, maybe four or five times, sometimes two, three times a month. Because your son, he may get in trouble, he go to the hole. So when he goes to the hole, they bring another person in. When you use the restroom, when you got to use the restroom, either you can wait until you have a wreck and use the restroom. When your son, going out, you say, okay, Sully, I'm using the restroom. Or say if you're on 4 o'clock camp and you use the bathroom. Well, we, we had like a little line, you know, when you're in prison, you get very, very creative in prison. We had like a string. A string up across the cell, and then you know, well, the, the bunks are the bunks are here. Cause you come in the door right here. You come into the door. The toilet is right here. You got the bunks here. You might have a a piece of string tied from here to there. And you put a sheet up in this bathroom. You have no choice. You, you, you have no you have no choice. You use the restroom. Especially if it's one of them gotta go bathroom moments. Yeah. Is there an unlimited amount of toilet paper in your cell? They, they give you two a month, but you, you, you month. They, give, they give you two a month. One for you, and one for you, and one for your cellie. Now, some institutions you can you can buy off commissary. You buy the, you can buy the good stuff off commissary. Um, other than that, you know you can you may go to a CO, CO, CO can I, I get a roll of toilet paper or something like that. Everything is limited. Mm -hmm. Was there any time at which uh, someone came in your cell and took anything? Or did you know other cells who were robbed during uh, any time? So um, not, when I was, not, not when I was down state prison in Rome because, like I said, everything's controlled movement, the door slide. Like, say for wreck. They say five minutes of wreck. When you come out for wreck, they automatically slam the doors behind you. Now, you might have a good, you might have an officer, he might tell you, oh, officer, I forgot something to myself. He might open the door and let you go back in. Um, when I was at Monmouth County, um, over in Monmouth County, they um, they would open your cell doors. They didn't have the slide door. They had the doors, they actually push a button and the doors actually opened up. So I know guys were getting their stuff robbed, the commissary, you know, people sneaking their cell. Cause you had a three tier cell, a three, three tier prison on the tier. So you know, all that stuff happens there, you know? It, ha it happens there. A lot of gang activity is right there. Mm -hmm. Well, when you said like buy and stuff, like, did you have money to do, or how did? No, you have money in your account. Right. See if your parents sent you hundred dollars. Mm -hmm. You you get a printout. How much you have in your account? And then when you went to the store, you fill things out. It's called commissary. Mm -hmm. You fill your paperwork out, and then when you go to the store, it's not like a real store. It's a, it's a commissary store in a compound. You give your paper to another inmate, he look at what you need, then you put it in the bag. And what they do, they hit the computer, they check your account. Then they take the money out of your account. And then they give you a printout of what you have left in your account. And another inmate takes the money out? Well, no, they, they look at the computer. Okay. They, 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 run, they, they have an officer there, too. Okay, that's awesome. The officer looks at your account, okay, you got $150 in your account. You know what you got in your account. Money. Do you work in the prison? You work in the prison. I made $33 a month. You know, I work. You know, some people, some inmates didn't have nobody giving them anything. Some inmates had to work. I was fortunate to work and plus have people on the outside give me money. But some inmates didn't have that. They burned their bridges down on the street. They couldn't get anything from anyone, not even a letter. Mm -hmm. Like, would you be able to get money from other inmates or that? No, that, that's illegal here. Oh. That's illegal here. A lot of inmates were doing stuff like that. 
say if you say if you owe me money for drugs, I would call your people, or maybe you you would get in contact with your people and send money in my account. That's illegal. That's illegal. They do an investigation. I get cash. Well, you don't get cash. You know, you just only time you get cash from that prison is when you get released from that prison. They might give you a check or they might give you cash. When I left the federal prison, I had. I was, going, I was on my way to the halfway house. I had like 200 something dollars in my account, so they gave me cash then. Because I was halfway home and halfway out. In the halfway house, you have cash. You have, you have first of you have cash in your pocket. But in the prison, you, you, you couldn't. You couldn't have cash at all. Mm -hmm. What was the halfway house like? The halfway house is, like, the halfway house is halfway home. Halfway, on the, halfway home and halfway in prison. You have rules and regulations in there too, especially federal halfway house. I never, I never, never in the state halfway house. Federal halfway house, you are still, a, you are still property of the Federal Bureau of Prisons. You have rules and regulations. You get caught with a dirty unit, they send you right back to the prison. You get caught with a cell phone, they send you right back to your prison. It was simple. It was just cut dry like that. You have rules and regulations you had to abide by. If you went out on a pass, if you you if you're past two hours, you come back two hours and twenty minutes, then get you for escape charge. Some guys don't come back. It's senseless, but some guys will leave and they don't come back. And the U.S. Marshals will pick them up later. A lot of guys have dirty units. They get they get in them halfway house. They start getting high. They start getting high. Okay. <laughs> Automatically, they gave you they gave you a, a pop drug test. Random. You don't know they gonna call your name. All right, next man, come on, go in the back. So you you if you don't get high, you have to worry about. It. Even when I was on federal probation, that federal PO would pop up on you. Okay, let's go in the bathroom. Automatically, he got he got everything to test everything right there. With he ain't got to take nothing back to no lab. Everything right there. Testament. He got his gun, he got his handcuffs right there. You know? So when I came over prison, I had, I had three years probation. Almost got myself jammed up one time. Driving out no license down south. I told Mr. Montone about it. Almost. Almost made a bad decision. Bad decision. Almost got me sent back to prison. But I got all I got. It, it was a blessing that the officer down south, I was honest when I said, sir, I ain't got no driver's license. I'm taking my girlfriend and her son, my girlfriend and her child home. He said, you know what, I'm going to run your name. Ran my name, no, I was on federal papers. So do for you, Mr. McFadden. He said, I'm not going to get you with driving on suspension, I'm going to get you with driving a driving license. $200 ticket. But still in all, even though I paid the ticket, if it got crossed my PO's desk, that's a violation. Any kind of probation, I don't care if it's state, county, federal, once you get in any kind of involvement with the police, it's a violation. It's a violation. Never hit his desk. I had about a month left on probation. This is like almost 16 months later. My PO said, um, Jacob, you ain't getting no trouble, did you? I'm like, no, what are you talking about? He said, oh, somebody out of something got in some trouble, I thought it was you. I said, man, I've been on probation in another three, four weeks. I know it. No, it's not me. But I could have got myself in trouble. Driving out no license. It's against the law. Driving out no license. And right after that, Mr. Montone, that compelled me to get my driving license back. My driving license back. Any other questions? I just want to thank y'all for allowing me to come in and speak to y'all. Give you a little bit about who I am, what I've done. You know, I don't know, I don't know your situation. I don't know what you've been through. But it's not where you've been, it's where you're going. Stay on the right track. Don't let this, don't let this Twilight program be a downfall for y'all. It's here to help you. It's, up to, it's here to help y'all. Officer Yager, they're here to help. To help to, help to assist, uh, assist you all. You got to be willing to accept the help. If the means are here to put you on the right track, it's up to you to have a made up mind. 
to do the right thing. I don't want to see none of y'all in prison. I don't want to see none of y'all hanging. See none of y'all handcuffed. I guarantee you, if one of y'all got in trouble right now, whoever I, if one of y'all got in trouble, y'all had to go to prison. First thing is gonna pop up in your head. I remember that guy Jacoby spoke to me about it. Cause everything everybody was telling me to get on the right track, when I was out in the streets, best believe, when I got to that prison, everything came right back in my remembrance. Everything. I mean, everything. My kid's mom, she begged me, Jacoby, get yourself together. Get yourself together. You're thumping your way through life. In and out of these kids' lives. As long as I come give her $1,000, I thought that was okay. Here, take this $1,000, I'm gone. She said, it's not about the money. You're spending time with us. You're spending time with your kids. When I got incarcerated, first thing came to my mind, all the things that she said. Because you got time to think. When you're in prison, you got time to think. You behind that wall. You got time to really think about the things that you, you have done. But not to have a pity party for yourself. But you, you, you think about the things you have done. But once again, thanks for having me. I would love to come back again. Thank you. I want y'all to stay on the right track and you're gonna do what's right. Okay? Thank you.